15, 2024. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison, may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum or the, of the committee. Ms. Chike Kalu. Yes. Present, sorry, present. Ms. Dominowski? Here. Ms. Pumphrey? Ms. Pumphrey? Present. Ms. Dolowski? Present. Ms. Lichter? Present. Thank you. Ms. Cox, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. DiDonato? Present. Dr. Kraft? Present. Ms. Blotner? Present. Ms. Myers? Present. Ms. Wicks? Present. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please call and note the names of any other staff members participating in the meeting. Do we have any others? Nope, that's all we have. Okay, thank you. Committee chairs will facilitate discussion by calling off names of committee members to speak in turn. Committee members will also acknowledge they have a question by calling on the chair, then saying their name. Staff members will answer any questions posed by committee members by saying their name, then first, then speaking. Um, staff members that want to add any discussion may call on the chair to speak, then saying their name. If the chair calls for any motions, the committee member will move and say their name, and a second committee member will second and say their name. The chair will then state may have a roll call vote. Assistants will speak each committee member for their vote and record appropriately for the ETA. Okay, so first on the agenda, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, and first on the agenda is considerations for curriculum committee review. This um, started a long time ago. I actually think um, it was Ms. Booker Dwyer's um, idea that we have some consistency in um, what looking at curriculum and looking at new materials. So I sent this to you. I just want to show you the final thing I sent to you to see if there's any last revisions or comments. Um, and then it will be what. Um, what Dr. DiDonato's um, department will use when presenting to us. I'm hesitating because I'm looking for my share button. I can't. Where is my share? Um, lost Should my share button. Oh. I know. Um, oh, take control. That's why. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's. <laughs> I don't want to take control. Um, but now, where would the share button be? Oh, here it is. Okay. Just find it. Okay. Can everybody see my screen right now? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. All right. So um, take a minute and just look at, again, this is what I sent you, the most recent update that I um, sent with the input that was provided. So the top is information requested for reviewing new curriculum or materials. And then the second part is information requested for renewing or extending curriculum and materials. So I'll give you a minute to look at that and then um, we'll see if there's any questions. Are there any questions from board members or staff? Nope. Everybody good? Hi, hi Ms. Lichter, it's Dr. Dinato. Sure. Um, I think when we had talked in um, last year, we had talked about focusing on um, the curricular materials that were aligned with the priority areas. Right. I didn't know if we like wanted to say that somewhere. So like, and I think one of the most salient example was, you know, some of the um, materials that we use for, you know, like, lumber for CT programs and those kinds of things, um, you know, contract extensions on, um, you know, maybe a platform that has been used 
that hosts other things, but it's not directly aligned with um, ELA or math or special education or ELD curriculum. Um, so that we put in our purpose statement when okay. we revise the purpose, and that should be in our new board handbook, um, okay. or it is in our new board handbook, and I'll double check it. So like this was part of the metrics. Um, so we were Got tasked it. last, you know, the purpose yes. and then the metrics. So this was part of what we were going to use. So I can um, add it or put it all together, but that that part is included in the purpose statement. Okay, perfect. Um, any other comments? Okay, I'm going to stop sharing this and let's see. Go back to this. Okay, so um, Ms. Cox, do you want to share now? Oh, that worked. Look how smooth we did that. <laughs> and I just need to get my script. Okay, next on the agenda, um, we're going to discuss the fall reading screening data. And Dr. Kraft is here to um, facilitate that discussion. So I don't know, um, Dr. Dinata, did you want to start or are we going right to Dr. Kraft? We're going to go right to Dr. Kraft and then I'm going to pick up towards the end of it. Okay, thank you. All right, welcome. Uh, we are here to talk about the fall reading screener data uh, and to uh, share a little bit with you about where we are at this point in the year. And so I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Wicks for the very first slide. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kraft. So we wanted to frame our information today first in um, sharing with you the expectations for students who are at risk of reading difficulty um, per the Maryland Ready to Read Act and our Comar regulations. So the expectations are that students are screened three times per year. That's beginning of year, middle of year, and end of year. And based on those screenings, the expectation is that the school system will notify parents if students are identified at being at risk of reading difficulty. For those students then who have been identified, the expectation is that we will provide supplemental instruction for those students and that we will progress monitor that supplemental instruction that the students are receiving. Further, the expectation is that the system will communicate with parents regarding those progress monitoring results. And then finally, the expectation of both schools and district-wide is that then we will evaluate the efficacy of that supplemental instruction and determine next steps using that data to determine whether we need additional professional learning, some supporting resources, or some additional coaching to help support students and schools. And with that framing, I'm gonna turn it back to Dr. Kraft, I believe, who's gonna share some of those results from our fall assessments. Uh, great. All right, so next slide, please. So uh, first we'll look at our kindergarten reading screener. Uh, what we have done is we have shown you all of the subtest um, for the reading screener, uh, and this in particular is for our kindergarten students. I want to bring your attention to that bottom uh, right-hand box that has the red outline where it says composite. And the composite score is really the most robust indicator of students that might be at risk of reading difficulties. And so this helps us know students that might need some additional support. Um, and as I said, this is our screening data for the fall. Um, and so students that might need a little more attention based on the screener uh, will get a further diagnostic and um, additional support uh, and supplemental instruction as needed. Uh, next slide. We also uh, screened all of our students in grades one through three. And so what you see in front of you on the left-hand side are the results by grade level. Um, and then on the right-hand side, uh, the assessments completed by grade. And so we were about uh, 96 to 97% for every grade level. Um, the students that are not represented um, were uh, assessed in a different way that was not this electronic screener um, for a variety of reasons. And so what you can see is our students that are uh, in the blue and green are either reading at or above grade level already at this time of the year. And so you can see about uh, an average of 56% of our students in grades one through three are already at benchmark. Um, and so we will continue 
to uh, strengthen their reading instruction and help them grow. Um, and then the rest of our students are students that we will um, provide supplemental instruction to as needed um, to help them make the progress that they need to be um, on or above grade level by the end of this school year. We know grade three is on our roadmap for BCPS as one of our measures. Um, and so we know how important it is for students to be reading at or above grade level by the end of grade three. Um, and so that uh, helps us to know what supports need to be put in place um, at this time. Uh, next slide, please. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. D. Donato at this time. So I have the, the pleasure of sharing this uh, exciting, exciting data slide. So the top uh, graphic uh, looks at our reading screening data from the fall of last school year, 23-24, to the in comparison to that same group of students for our screening for school year 24-25 that just happened. And so the top band uh, demonstrates our students who are reading below the 25th percentile. And what we saw last year, so last year's first graders, we had 28.5% of students who were really reading below the 25th percentile. Those same students, because this data is comprised of just students who were tested in BCPS last year, as well as this fall, um, as second graders, we're down to only 20.6% 20 20 who are uh, reading below the 20th percentile. So that's that's a reduction of just about 8% of students reading um, below the 25th percentile. We're seeing the same positive decrease in number of students who are reading below the 25th percentile when we looked at our second graders as compared to our third graders. So our second graders last year, 29.5% of them are reading below the 25th percentile, as again compared to 23.8%. So what we're seeing is that we are having students move into a higher level of proficiency. The second band um, is even more exciting because this is our group of students who are reading above the 50th percentile. So in the fall of last year, you saw that 53.4% of our students um, we're reading at above the 50th percentile. That same group of first graders last year who are now our second graders, um, we're now at 63.9%, which means those students were making growth over the course of our school year, and we've had students sustain and maintain growth, which is very exciting and wonderful as they continue to um, work through our, our ELA program. Um, Second grade, we saw the same results, so 51.9% at the start of the school year above the 50th percentile. And in grade three, we and now as third graders, we see that we're close to 60% um, that are above the 50th percentile. And so we know that part of our you know, ability to, to support students in their reading progress is using high quality instructional materials, providing those daily opportunities to read, to uh, engage in rich discourse, to practice comprehension skills. Um, and we're seeing some really positive uh, trends from, from our reading screening data, especially when we look year over year with the same group of students. Next slide, I think that, and thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, are there questions from board members, from um, Ms. Dominowski? Yes, sorry, thank you for that. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, when we are notify parents that are flagged um, for the students that are at risk, what is sent home with the parents or to the parents or communicated to the parents when their students are flagged as being at risk? Uh, so parents are notified, schools do that, that does not come from um, the district level, but they are notifying the parents that uh, their uh, students, um, the results of the screener, um, and then additionally, um, they are notified what supplemental instruction will be provided um, based on um, being identified at risk. 
So is it is it centralized? Shouldn't each school be sending home the same type of information for at risk students that are flagged? Yes, so there is a, a letter, but we don't say that they, they, I mean, they can use, if they have a different format of a letter, they can, but we do provide one for them, and that is uh, pushed out in our reading specialist group, and we also provide it in multiple languages. And are they given um, anything else, like supplemental to work with at home for their students, a way that they can support their students at home? Uh, so there are um, on our website, um, there are different um, links that parents can use to uh, help uh, their students at home. Um, and depending on the school, they might also have other things that they provide or encourage. Um, a student that is um, labeled at risk really should be receiving supplemental instruction um, to help um, help them in their trajectory to reaching on grade level proficiency. So the the links that are you know on our website and the stuff that um, parents uh, that some schools might send home is not something that's like centralized or is in a you know packet of like how this how you can help your student at home that goes home with students that are you know flagged as at risk or and getting supplemental instruction at school. Is that what you're saying? Uh, Ms. Dalmanowski, just give me one minute. I'm going to actually pull the, the letter up and look at it right quick um, okay. because I want to make sure I'm saying. So do you mind going on to your next question while I'm looking that up? And I also have Dr. Donato and Ms. Wicks here that can also answer while I'm just looking that up for you really quick. I just want to okay. make sure I'm giving you the most accurate information because Dr. Wolf unexpectedly couldn't be here tonight. So I actually did her part of the slides. So <laughs> give me one second, OK? OK. So, so Ms. Domanowski, there are centralized resources. However, schools might tailor things that they're sending home to students. Um, again, the teacher knows what you know area that the student had a deficit in. Um, and so they might send home one thing or another for families to use. Um, you might have a parent who asks for more things and then the school would work with them to provide additional items. So it's not a universal, everybody gets this. Um, it's really looking at the teacher practitioners and the reading specialists at the school to identify, um, you know, from things that are available that, again, they can select from based on what the students' needs really are that they may provide for a family to use at home. Some of our Title I or community schools have other universal resources that they may send home to families also um, that might be supportive of reading in general. It might not target a specific skill or area that a student needs, but it's more a holistic view. So it it is a little bit dependent on the school and some of the other initiatives that individual schools might be doing. I guess what my, like the bottom line question I'm trying to get okay. at is, that, so you have, say you have A and B student and they have, they're at risk. They have the same kind of generalities of, you know, why they're being flagged, screened, um, the same kind of supplemental instruction they're going to be receiving in school. Are they getting the same information? And th they could be two different schools. Are they right. getting the exact same information, um, you know, at minimum? They are, get, they are getting and being they sent are, home to them. Right. From, so they as, are, as a, as not right. just being notified of like, you know, instructional wise, like what is being sent home to that to their parents to let them know that they're you know, yes. Getting all the, all the yes, all the letters are standard. That's why we can actually translate them into the multiple languages. Um, what I was saying is that sometimes there might be an additional, you know, piece of information because schools sometimes, you know, make different purchases or they 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 do different things. As you know, we have Title I schools, we have community schools. So what I was trying to say is there's a base letter that we have provided for everyone. Um, that is the letter that we have translated into. Um, and I was going to tell you how many, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We have it translated into 14 different languages. So to answer your base question, yes, there is a letter that is sent home. We have it translated into 14 different languages so that if you need a different language for a student, you can. So that information is standard from the district and is provided at the beginning of, of every year. Um, but then looking at could schools offer some additional information? I think Dr. DiDonato, that's what you were just talking about. They absolutely could because we do trust our teachers to be able to, to know um, students. Um, by the time we finish reading screening um, at the end of September, um, 
most teachers have a really good grasp on their students. And so there is a base letter that goes out and um, everyone is getting that same information um, and available in 14 different languages. And then sometimes there is additional information that is it is that it that schools might add. Just to close that one up, can we get a copy of what is sent home to parents that are uh, that are when that notification goes out for that? Can we get a copy of that? Um, Dr. Dionato, is uh, is that is there a way we can uh, make that happen? Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. of course. Thank you. And then um, you said that they are most of these are like these are all electronic screeners, except for the four, three, and four percent that were shown in the graph is being given a different way. Are all these screeners done electronically? Um, our, all of our kindergarten students were assessed through Dibbles. That's not electronic. Um, okay. And then for the students that um, it's determined that the, the digital screener that is administered one-on-one -on -one with a student, then um, individualized that way. Um, th if that was not a good match for their ability, then they were assessed um, in a non-digital way. Okay. And then also, I'm just confused as to why we're doing, I know it shows a greater number, but typically we do for proficiency and, you know, read it like at or above, we do the 61% mark and all of these are at, are at or above 50. So um, I'm, why, why the change other than it's there, the numbers will be greater. Um, so 50 percentile is a national norm, meaning that you are average for that grade level. And so they're saying an average third grader would be reading at a 50th percentile. The 61% that we sometimes use really has to do with that uh, college and career trajectory. And so we know that we need to continue to increase the rigor for our students. Um, however, nationally, 50% is average, right? And so we did break it into the bands. So you can see that we have the 50th, the 75th percentile, and then the 75th to above. So we are not um, trying to inflate any numbers, but to accurately report um, what nationally, when you are giving a screener, what it says, if you are at the 50th percentile, that means you are average for a, let's say a third grader for full administration. And so of course those numbers change as the year goes on. Um, and so that is why we report it like that um, to show um, where students are falling within each band. And then for each student, we are still trying to get them to accelerate. Even our students that we are calling at or above grade level readers, we still wanna see growth over time this school year for that. So, so just to also provide the around the 61st um, percentile number, that was based on um, BCPS did an alignment with um, PARC when there were the five levels of scoring and aligning it with MAP. And so the MAP assessment data is what we really looked at the 61st percentile with. And so there were uh, an comparative analysis that was done with uh, students needed to be in this percentile on MAP to be most predictive of being proficient. Um, and I believe it was actually back, I don't know if it was even um, before PARC, but I believe it was PARC when that analysis was done. So that's where the 61st percentile comes from. And that's really what we look for on, on MAP. I, I understand. I just, the, okay. the reason I'm asking is that I know the whole, I, why we're we getting you know the k through three is that it's part of the ready to read act and i'm wondering if maybe we should set our standards a little higher because as if you look at the map scores once we get to you know sixth seventh and eighth you see those percentages go down and if we could get our kids stronger in the k through three as you know we have to by law and set a higher standard are we not setting them up for a better success in sixth, seventh, and eighth, and, and ninth grade and beyond, where we're not giving them these, you know, screenings as often. Oh, and it is certainly it is certainly our goal to to continue to move all of our students forward. Right? It, it's not that anything instruction doesn't stop just because the students hit the fiftieth percentile. So I think it, it's looking at really um, what's identified as as an at risk range. Um, it again does not mean that students don't are provided with reteach opportunities. They're still provided with, you know, small group instruction if they need it on a specific skill. So it doesn't take away from the other instructional um, things that teachers are doing to support student learning. Um, but absolutely, we we want you know our students to move even 
further forward and yes we want to move all of our students at, um, up to the 50th percentile and then up to the 75th percentile um so it, it certainly isn't a um end target for us by any stretch of the means is there any consideration of continuing the screening after the third grade to follow these students to make sure that they keep you know excelling and aren't you know falling behind um, so that's a great question. Uh, so what happens is we have um, map testing, which does serve as a screener. So if they are scoring below a certain percentile, then once they take that fall map, then we actually do a diagnostic assessment, just like we do with this screener. So we already do have a screener in place. And in the interest of not over assessing students, we use the screener that we already have in place, which map will tell us, you know, are they reading below a third grade level, which means that we are first going to test to make sure that they have all their decoding skills in place. And so after that screener is given, if we notice that a student is, is showing up at risk, uh, then they are further assessed. And the same thing happens, then they are given supplemental instruction um, based on the results of the diagnostic assessment. So correct, I could be wrong on this, but if a student is getting the MAP test and they have an IEP that says that, you know, they need help with the reading of certain words or math problems, is that going to affect how their test scores or MAP are and whether or not they're reading at grade level? So Mr. Manowski, if they if a student has an IEP that has reading objectives on it, they they have actually much more comprehensive assessments that were completed with them yes. to identify those needs. And so they would re receive the services in alignment with, with whatever um, their IEP said, but they have actually even more comprehensive needs. So if, if they're receiving um, the accommodation of a reader on an assessment, um, then they've already been identified as needing reading intervention. Um, so that that is already in place and sort of outside of just even the general sort of screening process. Okay, great, thank you. No problem. Thank you, Ms. Stileski, you had your hand up. Thank you, thank you for the presentation. Um, it's great to see the increases in um, the on or above grade level and then the re uh, reduction with the below grade level. Um, I just have a couple of questions. So the first one, in terms of the notification of parents, I'm going to assume from slide two that those would be the students that fall in that red yellow range, which is the like below 50%. I just want to make sure that that's who would receive the letter. Yeah, so uh, the um, some schools send it out to everyone, and certainly that is a best practice. But what is required um, by law is that if a student is not meeting um, grade level benchmarks, that we do inform them of that. Um, and then again, make a plan for supplemental instruction. And then we also, um, as time goes on, we communicate progress monitoring results to the parents in whatever supplemental instruction they are given. Okay, and then in just in terms of the notification, I know that it's a letter. Are there, um, just because I know some people might not check their mail, or I don't know if it's an email letter, a, a snail mail letter, um, but is there any um, voicemail outreach, like a like a robocall on a on a cell phone number, or just as an additional means of of making sure that we can reach all the parents? So I think, Ms. Selesky, that's really up to the individual schools to look at how they best communicate with families. So I think, um, you know, certainly a, a school that finds that, you know, I, I was an elementary school principal. So, you know, I knew certain strategies that were worked really well with communicating with my families. Um, and so, you know, we would believe and expect that the, the schools are imploring those strategies. Um, additionally, you know, as we're coming up towards the end of a marking period and elementary conference day, that's another time where schools are reaching out to families and certainly would be having these kinds of follow up discussions with families, you know, at conferences, um, you know, making notation, just even progress that's been made since the screening, um, you know, given it's, it, it's still a couple weeks away till conference day. But we'd really hope that um, schools are using the strategies that they know work best with their families. Um, to, to communicate with them. Sure, thank you, that makes perfect sense. And um, just my second question, in terms of the supplemental instruction, 
Um, thankfully, the staffing shortages are much better this year when compared to last year. But can you just talk briefly, is there any negative impact of any kind of staffing shortage, whether it's with special ed or regular education, regarding the supplemental instruction that um, you're implementing for those that need? Thank you. I, because I don't know the exact staffing and staffing circumstances of every single school, I, I can't specifically respond to that. But what I can say is that if a school had a concern um, with accessing, you know, a substitute who might be working with a not students who are requiring intervention, but with covering a class. So a teacher who has the skills to work with students who need an intervention could work with them. Um, I am not aware of any circumstances where this has like been brought to the to the level of the curriculum office as, as a concern. Um, I'd certainly defer if Dr. Kraft or Ms. Wicks have heard anything, but there's nothing that I've been like made alert aware of that this is a concern. Um, at this point, um, we, in past years, we there have been concerns and we've had to troubleshoot. At this point, there have not been any calls to our office where, um, you know, someone's saying like, well, I don't know how to do this or we don't have all the staffing or we're missing a reading specialist. So I think we're in a really, and again, I'm not HR, but as far as I know, we're in a really good place staffing wise. Um, and uh, you, we have not had the same kind of level of calls of like, what do I do now? And so I, um, I, again, I do want to say what Dr. D. Donato said, which is, which is a disclaimer that I don't know every individual school, but I can just tell you that I don't have anybody asking for help um, like we might have had in previous years. Okay. Thank you for answering my question. That's really great to hear. Thank you. Um, thank you. Ms. Pumphrey, question? Oh, I'm sorry. My question was answered. I forgot to lower my hand. <laughs> okay. I have um, a question on one of the slides in the beginning where you listed um, talking about the Maryland Ready to Read Act. The last um, bullet kind of said evaluate efficiency of supplemental instruction. Is that still on an individual level, like how it's working for that child, or is that looking at it systemically? Um, I love that you asked this question. Um, this might be my favorite one to answer. Um, it's actually looking at it in three ways. So one is we are looking at, is it effective for the individual child? And we actually have a new data monitoring system that I'm very excited about where we are tracking that progress for students. So if Ms. Wicks is in intervention, um, I am able to look at her individually um, against each progress monitoring in a graph format to see, is this intervention working for her? And is it starting to narrow the gap between where she is and where I need to be her, be, where she needs to be on grade level. We also want to look at it at a classroom level or delivery level. So however that is being delivered in a school by the grade level, we want to look and say, is this intervention being um, effective in this school, in this place with this grade level? So that's another level. And finally, we want to be able to look at the district level and we want to say, and I'm going to use a secondary ex example, but we had decided not to continue the use of system 44 because we were looking at district level data and we were just not seeing the kind of growth we needed for secondary students that still had decoding skills gaps. And so we made the decision to discontinue that. And that is what we want to continue to do is we always want to look and say, do we have interventions that are closing the gap for students? Because the idea is we want students out of intervention and not just, well, every year you're going to get intervention again. We want to get you to grade level. And if we have an intervention that is not doing that, we want to be able to look at it with some objective data and say, we don't think this is a match for our school, our district, and we are going to look for something that might accelerate growth in a better way. Thank you. I mean, that's um, really good information. And how often does that happen? So that evaluation piece, I know for the individual child, but like on the district level, how often are you looking and at the um, school based level? So we do it every summer. So once we have that last piece of data, uh, we are looking and actually, so one of the things that we do is we put out an, you know, an improved intervention list every year. Um, and that is based on what we do over the summer. When we look at that data, we look at the movement, we look at all of the things that go with that and we make a determination, is this something? And sometimes, I don't wanna just say we eliminate programs. If we need to, we do, but sometimes it's like, what's the last time we gave PD to the entire 
entire district, right? And so in in some cases, it's it, it's us saying, we think we need to provide more PD or differentiated PD, or we need to make sure reading specialists know how to you know monitor. And so we look at all of those things. And so certainly at the most extreme, we can remove an intervention like I explained a minute ago, or we might say, what are the things that we need so that teachers can do this more effectively or the whoever's delivering the intervention can do it more effectively. And so um, it's really on a yearly cadence that we look at that because you want to give everything enough time before you make a major decision to remove something. And also what can be exciting is that school level data, because if it's working in some places and not working in others, then it's not ready to, to you know, get rid of the whole thing. But That's sometimes I think for those best practices and where it is working can be, you know, highly um, impactful for other schools. So thank you for that. Yes. Um, any last questions about this topic from any of the board members? I think we did ask a lot of them, but I'll give you one more chance. Not seeing any hands up. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Kraft, for that, and Ms. Wicks for that information. Thank you. Um, okay, now I gotta find my script again. Next on the agenda um, is the ELD curriculum updates, and Ms. Blotner will um, go through that with us. Good evening, everyone. So good to see all of you. And I'm looking forward to sharing an update about where we are with our ELD curriculum updates. Um, so we can go to the next slide. I'd like to share two things with you. I want to talk a little bit about the elementary as well as secondary and then give you time to be able to share um, any questions or comments that you have. So to begin this conversation, I just wanted to anchor two bodies of policy. When we think about the work we're doing with our multilingual learners right now in Baltimore County, we anchor to some of the recommendations from the MSDE multilingual learner work group, and they had a recommendation 3C, which spoke specifically to the need to have effective English language development instruction. And that needs to be anchored to standards. In our case, we're looking at anchoring to the WIDA standards, as well as the grade level Maryland College and Career Readiness Standards, and specifically connected to English language arts. So we're reinforcing that goal around literacy. And then we also want to also keep in mind the COMAR regulation which is 13A050703, which speaks to the programming for our multilingual learners. And that says that we must have curriculum resources. We need to make sure those are materials for instruction for teachers. We need to make sure that we've got research-based program delivery models. In our case, it would be looking at co-teaching, it's looking at small group instruction, it's looking at having ELD courses in place at the secondary level, and that they're taught by certified ELD teachers. So with that, I wanna share a couple of updates for elementary, and then I'll share a couple for secondary, and then open it up for questions. So we can go to the next slide. So first, you'll remember we've shared with you that we were really looking at ensuring that our English language development instruction at the elementary level was directly aligned to the newly adopted curriculum. We know that our students need to learn how to listen, speak, read, and write, but they need to be able to do that using the academic language that is required for them that aligns to the grade level curriculum. So that was the reason why we've adopted some resources. If you can go to the next slide. So with that, um, there were several things that we needed to consider when we thought about what our teachers needed. They needed pacing guides so that they understand what they should be doing for different multilingual learners at different proficiency levels for by marking period. So what, how are they aligning their ELD to the skills that are being taught in the curriculum, to the academic language that students need to learn? For students that are at English language proficiency levels one and two. So those are the lower proficiency levels. We're using the ELD tabletop lessons. And so those are available for grades K through five. And then we also have designated ELD lessons for modules that are available for our ELD teachers that work with students at the upper proficiency levels, levels three and four. Along with that, they have Rigby readers as well as take and teach lessons. So they have a lot of resources that they are able to use to really support our multilingual learners. 
an example of what we've been doing to support our teachers. And I'll talk about professional development in a moment for both programs, but we are out providing supports directly in schools for ELD teachers, working with our administrators, working with our staff development teachers and reading specialists. So that's some of the work we're, we've done. And we have over 60 points of service of our specialists going out into schools and working with staff in over 30 elementary schools. And I know we have 116, so they will continue to do this level of support as we move forward into November and December and onwards. And our goal is really to ensure that we're out there, we're being providing those supports to schools. We also provide professional development both virtually and in person. If we can go to the next slide. So that was our elementary resources and what's in place. For secondary, you'll remember that we brought to a committee this, um, we went through the RFI process and we had the curriculum committee and the approval of the VISTA um, higher learning curriculum resources to be used and done field tested in our middle and high schools. And you can see the different resources that, uh, that align to the various courses. Really important for you to know, we really looked at this resource and we liked the fact that when we looked at Bridges A, B, and C, it aligned to the Maryland Common um, College and Career Readiness Standards for grades six through eight and vice versa. When we looked at Engage A, B, and C, it aligned to the um, Maryland Coll College and Career Readiness Standards for grades nine through 12. So that was really important to make sure that while our multilingual learners are in their ELD courses, they're receiving ELD instruction aligned to the grade level standard, and they're working on developing their skills around listening, speaking, reading, and writing. So it's really important to emphasize that, and we're really pleased with the resources thus far. Our next step is to do the analysis of the curriculum. We need to look at how students are performing. We need to look at the usage levels. And so we're working with the vendor to collect that data and do that level of analysis. If you can go to the next slide. So again, what is available for our teachers? They have pacing guides. They have um, ELD guides with lessons for teachers. There are learning activities for our students that can be directly assigned. There is right now we're focusing in on the virtual component. However, there also are workbooks that are available to students. There are also formative and summative assessments that are also available that our teachers can use to monitor students' progress towards attaining language proficiency. And so it really kind of gives them that benchmark data that they can use along the way. And we're also out providing that job embedded support for our um, teachers and our schools. So 31 points of service across 20 middle schools and 16 high schools. And we are continuing to go out and provide those additional supports. And that's gonna be something that continues into uh, through October, November, and will continue the entire year. If you can go to the next slide. And just in general, we know that there's a lot of support needed. So that means they, our teachers need professional development. And you can see some of the dates where we have provided professional development. It will also will be ongoing through the year. So we have another, another date coming up on November the 1st, and then there'll be another one at the end of the year. But all along the way, we have office hours for teachers, as well as collaborative planning sessions and ongoing professional development from the vendor and from our team. We also were able to provide coaching supports to schools. For elementary, we were able to work with 18 elementary schools and take the vendor in with us to go in and listen to what teachers need and provide supports and demo additional resources for teachers. We were also able to open it up for some of our smaller schools so they were able to join individualized sessions that could support them as well. For secondary, we were able to do 90 minute model lessons with Get Ready, Bridges and Engage at 20 middle schools and high schools. And we're really excited. We were able to also capture footage that we hope to bring to a future board meeting. If we can go to the next slide. Thank you. And I'll open it up for any discussions or questions. Thank you for that. Um, board members, do you have any questions about the presentation or information? I think we ran out of questions with our last presentation. No, <laughs> I'm not seeing any. Um, okay. 
Well, thank you for that update. Um, that was really Absolutely. provided us with a lot of details. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me get back to the script. So I think that was the last thing on our agenda. Um, and we don't need any motions because these were just updates and none of this um, has any contract implications. So that's why I didn't ask for motions for them. So is there any further business from anyone? Oh, Ms. Dominowski, you have your hand up. I just I had a general question. Are we um, going back to doing the presentations with pre-recorded um, so we can listen to them ahead of time? Or And I know there's only two for tonight, so there's plenty of time to present them, but in um, the future? This staff had decided just to do the PowerPoints without the voiceover. The voiceover was taking a lot of time and effort. They were doing it. Um, they wanted it to be perfect for us. So um, we were they're going to make the PowerPoints available as always ahead of time. Um, and then we will just ask questions um, when we get here. Thank you for asking that. I forgot to bring that up. Dr. Donato, do you want to add anything to that? No, I, I think I appreciate the work that our staff has been doing. And I think we set some really high standards as far as expectations for them being present in schools and working with teachers as well as administrators. Um, and trying to juggle and balance their time. Um, they were spending an exorbitant amount of time on um, the presentations because, yes, they are public, they're published. And so, um, you know, we will make very robust, detailed uh, presentations. If you notice there's a whole lot of more words on some of these slides than we've had in the past trying to, you know, capture that information. Um, but again, really trying to optimize their time and their ability to be in schools, working with um, teachers. Um, is our focus. Um, but, but again, the PowerPoints will still be developed for us and because I, I think that is really helpful um, to prepare for the meeting. So um, thank you to the staff for working on the PowerPoints. And you know, I do understand the, the voiceover time constraints. Um, any other questions? Um, thank you for that question, Ms. Domanowski. Any other questions? I just have a comment. Yes. Um, I didn't I didn't make this comment during the first presentation because although it came to mind during the first presentation, I think it relates in general to um, when data is shared with us. Um, although I certainly completely understood the explanation as far as why we were looking at 50 percentile instead of the 61 percentile, it may be helpful not only for board members, but also for the public if we could just be shown both, even if it doesn't, you know, I understand the reason, completely understand the reasoning, but so that they're comparing apples to apples and don't feel like, you know, when they're looking back and comparing data from last year to this year or whatever, they can find it and compare it on their own without um, giving second thought as far as the why those percentages might be different. Just a thought. And of course, if it doesn't cause any difficulty or um, more work on our staff members. I think we can try to do that if the like data points align. So I think it, the again, the 61st percentile was really is for MAP, and we were looking at the reading screening that um, we used a mirror for. And so that they're like different metrics. Um, what I can do though, is I will talk with GRAA to find out like what is an alignment, um, because again, the 61st percentile was based on a state assessment metric that was identified that if you had, if you scored in the 61st percentile or above, you would get a three, and that was actually when Park was a five, a one through five assessment that you would score three, four, or five. So that's where that number came from. So while it's it is a number that was wedded in BCPS for a really long time, um, it was sort of arbitrary for some other things. But I can talk with them to see if we can. Again, I understand trying to create a, a equitable comparison between things, um, to see what they would recommend for us. Understood. And again, it was more of a general comment not specifically to that um, presentation thank you and and i think it, if i'm understanding correctly it's also the purpose behind it so the real purpose of that screening is to identify the kids in most need versus i mean it's great that we're making that progress but what we're really trying to do is eliminate the kids that that are falling behind is that true dr di donato for what we saw today Right. For the reading screening, it really is the percentage of students that, that we're identifying that we need to really dig into to look at what their learning needs are versus, right, the, the other end of the spectrum. Um, and so, again, really looking at, you know, based on national norms, we still have work to do. Yeah, true. 
Um, any other um, general comments, further business? Okay, hearing none, the last item on the agenda is announcements. Our next curriculum committee meeting will be held on November 14th, 2024. So at this time, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you to staff for your participation and to the board members for attending. Have a wonderful Thank evening. You. Um, and have a wonderful day. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Thank Good night, you. everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night.